family, it's time for a true look at your world. <laughs> Let's get hooked up for Pack Therapy. Here's your hosts, Tim Donnelly and Graham Hill. Welcome into an edition of the Pack Therapy Podcast. I'm Tim Donnelly, Graham Hill along with us as always. I think, you know, I was thinking about this. Podcasts weren't around 41 years ago. So there is a better than 0% chance that on a, a weekly following the NC State Wolf Pack, uh, on a podcast like this one, this is the first time this will ever be said. The North Carolina State Wolf Pack are headed to the Final Four. That's wow, that's a really fair assessment. I mean, him. I mean, this might be the first time anyone could text the NC State Wolfpack are headed to the Final Four. It wasn't around 41 years ago. Yeah. First time somebody sent an email about the NC State Wolfpack being sent to the Final Four today or yesterday, right? Or late at night or from the bell tower where Graham was in the middle of the night. Whatever time it was. Wh- whatever time it was. This is the first time in a long time that the NC State Wolfpack, that that program – that has been through so much, that it's had so many good players, so many NBA players since then. First time they can say they're one of the four teams left standing in the men's basketball NCAA Final Four. Stand up and take a bow. It's fun to say. It is, it is fun to say. By the way, like, subscribe, uh, share this podcast everywhere you can. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, Graham, you were at the Bell Tower last night. Yes, I slept there. <laughs> I mean, not really. It was it was there during sleeping hours. Yeah. Um. By the way, NC State beat Duke, did so handily. If you haven't seen it, it's strange that you're listening to the NC State Pack Therapy podcast. Uh, but if you haven't seen it, if you haven't paid attention, it was uh, a victory that looked like the better team won. It was a victory that was owned by DJ Burns. It was a victory that that I believe was cathartic and and therapeutic, Pack Therapy, for <laughs> a lot of Pack fans where, where some metaphorical monkeys were ripped off of backs some weights were taken off of their chest. It was a big moment for, for Wolfpack Nation. You guys are kind of going to see a little bit behind the scenes here at Pat Therapy. We're going to pull the curtain back a little bit. Tim and I usually don't plan these podcasts out. We don't mm-hmm. know what, how, what that speaks about in our careers. But, I mean, where, where do we start at? Is this going to be more of an analysis? Is this more of a celebration? Is it reflection? Are we going to laugh, cry? Are we going to hug each other at some point? I mean, <laughs> Tim, thinking back on it, one uh-huh. thing that I've kind of find myself doing at night when I'm trying to go to bed is – I'll go back. And what I've started doing is I'll mm-hmm. go back and listen to some of our previous episodes. And then you're wide the awake season. because they're so so magnetic and dynamic. That, and they're so good, which is why you should like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> but I'm just thinking to myself, like, all right, how it started versus where we're at. Like, it's just so crazy to think about. I'm, I'm going to take one step further. It's not even where it started. It's where it finished versus where they're at. Or where it's going. It, it's, it's not... Like where they if you would have told me they were going to be one of the 25 best teams in the country at the beginning of the year, I might believe you. There's yeah. a lot of talent on that team and 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 we we I mean you go back and listen to the podcast. Uh if you would have told me they were going to be one of the final four standing at the end of the regular season, I would have told you you were crazy. Yeah. And and I would not have felt bad about it. I could, I would have felt I was being optimistic about NC State by saying there's almost no way they're going to make the final four. It's it's truly, and this is why sports are so great. This is why this run is so great. It is truly, truth is stranger than fiction. If if you were writing like an underdog scrappy movie, you would have had to give them more moments of of excitement throughout the season to make this possible, or else it would feel like oh, that's just some scriptwriter wrote it. I, the, the, this is how they're going to play uh, Purdue in the Final Four. Okay. Yes, I, I'm just going to say the words Final Four as many times as I can because it's fun to say. We have it on a graphic here if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, graphic here. Got a point in the right direction. There you go. If you're writing on YouTube. Uh, they're going to be playing uh, Purdue. This is a sick graphic, by the way. Shout out to Video Joe. Yeah, it's a super sick graphic. But it's beautiful. Uh, uh, Purdue has four losses all season. Yeah. They, they have four losses over the entirety of their season. NC State had four losses in their final four regular season games. And and they're at the same place with the same one-fourth opportunity to go win a national championship. That doesn't happen except for, for the Wolfpack. And 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 this is the way that, that it has to happen for them, right? The, the, the first uh, final four since since uh, Jimmy V, right, since Valvano, it was not going to be where they were like a one seed and they just mowed down worse opponents, right? It was going to be when they were an 11 seed. 
it was going to be where not, not one of the years where they had Dennis Smith Jr., not one of the years where they have a super exciting recruiting class or, or, or you know, Julius Hodge coming back. It wasn't going to be a year where everybody's expectations were high. It was going to be a year where they didn't have high expectations to live up to, but they had rock-bottom expectations and flew by him at 100 miles an hour, and that's where they are. And that's where they should be, right? It's it's very NC State, right? It's it's I can't tell you how many times people and the funny part is, uh, you know, I'm relatively new to on air here, been following the teams for a long time, but relatively new to on air here in the scheme of things, right? Uh everybody keeps telling me about NC State stuff, right? And and whether you believe in it or not, you believe in the the, the curse or not, you believe in this or not. NC State stuff this this postseason run has been the good stuff, yeah. right? It's been, oh, look at this. Oakland's going to take care of Kentucky before you have a chance to play them. That's pretty fortuitous. Oh, look at this. Kyle Filipowski is going to foul out with five minutes left. And I know you had something to do with it, but still, that's pretty fortuitous, right? Michael O'Connell's shot against UVA in the ACC championship. That's NC State stuff. It's it's different flavors, right? The, the old NC State stuff might have tasted bad. The NC State stuff on this run – uh, is is the the good breaks right? The things out of their control or maybe a little lucky have been going their way, which is is new, refreshing, and it only happened when they reached absolute rock bottom and their coach's job was on the line, uh, which feels like it was three months ago. It was twenty days ago. I there was somebody in the last pack there that myself and Corey Smith did while you had birthday responsibilities. By the mm-hmm. way, I hope, hope your son had a oh, great yeah. birthday, number three. And he was saying to call this team dominant in the NCAA tournament was bad on our part because of relying on a prayer buzzer beater from Michael O'Connell in that in, ACC tournament. In the tournament. ACC tournament, right, 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 right. Take, let Oakland take you to overtime, and then he listed one other thing. Maybe it was let Marquette come out to the game, but is it fair to say, and it's kind of a chalk, I guess it could be a chalk take, but I've always just been under the belief that good teams know how to win when they shouldn't, especially in a postseason scenario. And NC State, to me, is a really freaking good basketball team. To me, the the UVA game is is the one you can't. They had a good free throw shooter on the line with five seconds left and a three point lead. The win, winning that one is is pulling a, a rabbit out of your hat. But part of it is, and, and this is the part that needs to be commended, is when opportunities arise through luck by by whatever way necessary, you have to be prepared to take advantage of it. Think of what they had to do to get the opportunity to be lucky against UVA. Yeah. Think of what they had to do since then to make that lucky break worth something, right? Because if, if they they you know hit the shot, Michael O'Connell becomes a legend, flexes on them, then they lose the next the next game. It's like a fun oh yeah story, right? It's it's like oh yeah that one year they almost pulled it off, but they they beat North Carolina in the ACC championship. Then they they take care of Texas Tech. Sure, did they let Oakland back in the game and, and it goes to the, the 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 overtime period? Yeah, but if you watched that game, NC State was the better team, right? And and to me that's why the UVA game is the one like they you know every run needs a break to go their way. Other than that, every single game. They've just been the better team, right? Both games against Duke, they were the better team. Against Oakland, they were the better team that let their foot off the gas, which is something you need to fix, but they're still the better team. That's the crazy part about it. You can say, right, because a lot of people were discrediting their run or discrediting the ACC's run uh, in the NCAA tournament as, like, March gets wacky. Yeah. What is it, nine games in 19 days? That's – Nine games is a big enough sample size. That's not just wacky. That is a good team playing well. They figured it out at the last possible second against all odds. But it's not just a wacky march. It's it's not. It is a um, very impressive march. And then now we're into April, and it's it's the only reason you're playing there is because you're a good team. It ha- it can't just be. Oh yeah, March is crazy. These things happen. I'm glad we're kind of on the same agreement of this as far as you can look at those scenarios of how maybe they escaped with a win, how they got by with a win. But at the end of the day, nine wins is nine wins. Nobody's gonna care about how you did it. All that's gonna all they're gonna care about is that right there. So Minecraft lover six eight oh nine two eight, whatever your username is. I appreciate your analysis, but at the end of the day, say what you want about NC State. 
they're going to the final four. Chances are your team isn't. So that's just that that is what it is. To me, to me, nine wins is not a fluke. It can't be. No. Can't be. Like the the greatest Cinderella stories, the whoa, how crazy are like four games, right? That's that's St. Peter's, that's fairly dick like one, two games. UMBC one game. This is not a a oh my gosh, they keep getting lucky. This is not like you're flipping a coin and it's land on heads 17 times. This is uh, flipping a coin and it landed on heads 130 times. And and that means you got a trick coin, right? Don't don't buy the, like, oh, how crazy is this? This is this is a team that that skews the odds in their favor. Um, and, and part of that is they just, they clicked. You know, I, I, one thing I want to give us credit for, and we were wrong about this team in a lot of ways. And I can, Absolutely. I can comfortably say that. When I was advocating for maybe DJ Burns plays a little less because he's such a liability on defense, huh, hand up, that guy should play more. As much as his uh, cardiovascular system can can leave him on the on the court, you play that guy. Hand up, I was wrong. But I will say, even in the, the darkest moments of the, of the state season, one thing that we stayed pretty clear on was – the whole season always was going to come down to could they find that chemistry when you bring in as many new faces and mixed like you know even even the DJ Burns they haven't been at state for 4 years right yeah. they they're all transfers they're all in here new uh like when you bring in that many uh O'Connell transfer Diara transfer Burns transfer Morcel a little bit longer here but transfer uh Taylor like everybody is a transfer so it was always you know, whenever they get that that chemistry, could it click? Could it click? Even when it was the darkest, we were still saying, like, I guess they could still, you know, figure it out. I'm. We got to the point where we didn't really think it was going to happen, so I'm not sitting here saying we knew this all along. But, but what I'm saying is there was always that chance that all of that talent they've assembled clicked. And, and they did it literally in the second half of the, the – first winner go home game right that louisville game they were down 12 in the first half they had dj horn and and didn't have dj horn who was out with the hip flexor and something clicked and from that point forward they've been i don't know if you want to call them one of the top four teams in the country which is what the the final four says they've been one of the top 10 or 15 teams in the country starting at halftime of the louisville game and and that might have just been when it clicked. The talent was always there, but the, it, it was inconsistent, and their roles were changing, and nobody really knew how to play. I find it so interesting, and honestly be- beautiful in a in a way that they stuck it out, they came together, and a part of the season where they could have easily divided off as a team and just thrown in the towel going into that Louisville game, it might have made them stronger losing those four straight at the end <laughs> of the mean, regular season. In retrospect, you change nothing, yeah. right? It's like. Uh, because knowing where it ended up, like you don't go 2020 hindsight, geez, I really w- wish they would have finished that game against UNC where they were up at half. It's like, no, what, how, it, you know, it's truly like, um, you know, when a, a, somebody that played the field a bunch is in their 20s, found the love of their life in, uh, in their 30s, and they're like, you know what? I wouldn't change anything because it led me here to you. It, it wouldn't, if you're state, you're not changing a darn thing, right? Was w- Would Kevin Keats maybe have a little bit more hair? Right? Would he be a little bit less stressed if if they went into the NCAA tournament and didn't play till Thursday? Yeah, maybe. But he's not changing anything right now. He wouldn't give up this run from how far down they were for anything, and and rightfully so. You shouldn't. And what's even more great about all this, and I'm glad you brought up Kevin Keats. Every post game press conference you listen to from guys like Casey Morse after they won the ACC championship, DJ Burns, DJ Horn last night, they all give so much credit and so much praise to their head coach, Kevin Keats, for saying when everybody else turned their backs on us and maybe gave up, he's the only one that still kept us together behind closed doors and rallied us together. And I think back to it, and I don't know why this just sticks in my head. Maybe it's because they played Duke last night to beat them. But after that Duke game at PNC Arena, Mm -hmm. I just remember – when John Shire was doing his press conference and I was coming from the interstate locker room, I had to wait out in the hallway with Kevin Keats. And you could tell that maybe he had just gotten emotional in mm-hmm. the locker room. Now, for whatever reason, maybe it was just because he had a moment with his seniors. I don't want to say this, but maybe he might have been seeing the writing on the wall. It's just so crazy to think about where he was at that point as far as in a mental state mm-hmm. to where he's at right now, just being on top of the world with this program. 
it, it, and and well earned, right? That you can't you can't take banners away. Final fours get banners. Uh, I, I've I have a list here in front of me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and I, I actually what, what is you that? did you did come prepared. I did, and I'm running off two and a half hours of sleep. So I appreciate you. Hey, pre- prepared is in different fashions. Uh, you can do it in different ways. Uh, but we're gonna take a break. When we come back, I have ten stories. Uh, some player related, some program related, some broadcaster related, some coach related. Uh, ten stories that I think are uh, part of uh, of of the story of this NC State team. Because like like I, I'll push back on one thing real quick before we take a break. Um, right, all of that like oh no one believed in us. Do you remember the 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 um. Anytime Graham and I get together, we're gonna to have some movie references. Remember the Titans, where where uh, Julius Campbell stands up and he and he says like, "Hey, I'm not perfect. Nobody is, right? Nobody's perfect, but as a team, we've been perfect because they they were undefeated." Yeah, I look at it and I say, "There's not a lot of individual underdogs on NC State. As a team, they were an underdog. Uh, you know, it's important to remember DJ Burns was a you know top." 70 recruit in the country went to tennessee out of high school top three in his state uh, behind zion williams <laughs> zion williamson and john morant um like uh dj horn had options right he played really well at arizona state last year he could have gone he came home um uh, like michael o'connell's transferring from stanford that's not exactly like you know hey i was at i was at a d2 school last year it's a future acc program there, um, there there's a lot of talent on that roster uh, there's a lot of individuals that have the ability to match up with anybody. As a team, where they were 20 days ago to where they are now, they're an underdog story. As individuals, right? All that I saw Zach Eady and so many coaches didn't didn't appreciate. You're seven foot four. A yeah. lot of coaches would have wanted to join your team, but as a team, NC State, the story is as good as any. And I have 10 ways to prove that coming up next, right here on Pack Therapy. Welcome back into Pack Therapy. I have my 10 stories. And by the way, this is uh, we, did, we talked about this before the break. I have 10 stories that I think kind of tell why NC State is such a, a, a on an incredible run. Um, these are 10. I could have probably written a list of 200, maybe yeah. 300. Who knows? Um, and also, they're not in any order. I want that to be clear. It's not like the best or the worst. It's just the 10 stories. First, 1983. The first story is everything this NC State team has done, particularly since they won the ACC tournament, but even on the ACC tournament, has been compared to one of the greatest runs in NCAA basketball history. Uh, right? It was it was Jim Valvano. It was running around. It was a buzzer beater to win the NCAA championship as a six seed. It is becoming mortalized in in the, the everything that went on with Jimmy V and the cancer and the speech and the, and the V fund and ESPN. It is how unbelievably difficult is it if every time you win a game, everybody goes, oh, let's compare this to the coolest story ever, right? It, it would be the equivalent of if you wrote a song or something and every single time they're like, well, let's compare it to let it be. It's like, yeah. oh, let's compare it to the Beatles, and you're just going like, well, how, whoa, whoa, whoa. How about we just see if this is a good song right now? But then to live up to it, right, to have everybody go, all right, let's compare it to Let It Be, and then you write a song that's as good as Let It Be. That is absurd. So, you know, they win the ACC championship. Everyone's like, uh-oh, it's starting to feel like 83. I'm going, well, relax. Let's see if it feels like 2015 first, right? Let's see if it feels like Sweet 16 before it feels like Final Four. But no, everybody went, nope, nope. Feels like feels like Jimmy V. Feel, feels like uh, you know Thurl Bailey. Feels like 83. And it's just like okay. And then somehow they lived up to it. That is absurd. Story number one. Story number two. Gary Hahn staying unretired. <laughs> this this might be more impressive than 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 the run itself. Gary Hahn play-by-play voice of, of NC State is retiring, excuse me, retiring, I'm getting choked up for Gary, uh, <laughs> retiring at the end of the year. And uh, that's known, right? So starting nine games ago, if NC State were to lose any game, that would be the last game broadcasted. And Gary Hahn has been around for decades. He has seen the the highs, the lows. He has ridden with, with NC State. Uh, and And I have to imagine, like, you know, you don't plan a, like a goodbye speech. 
But I guarantee you there's some people he wants to thank, like the yeah. last time on air. There's something he wants to say, probably wants to uh, you know, thank the, the, the program and, and certain players and coaches and other media members. And he just keeps like, you know, taking out that piece of paper, unfolding it, and then about five minutes left in the game, folding it back up, putting it back in his pocket and going, maybe I'll use it in, in the post game next time, but not today. It's an unbelievable story. As someone who has a little bit of background in play-by-play commentary, just at the D3 level and high school level, nothing at the at the D1 status, I used to always think about, you know, doing your prep, mm-hmm. you know, getting your spreadsheets, writing your stats. I wonder if there was ever a point where Gary's sitting there thinking like, wow, this is the last time I really could be doing this. Every maybe, time. I maybe guarantee before, you every time. Maybe it's before that Louisville game. And, yeah, maybe now it's just muscle memory of every time. Or maybe it's just at a point where – he doesn't even think about that anymore. Like he's just truly enjoying the ride and enjoying the stats that he it's, gets to fill in more and more. It's every time, every single time he fills it out, he has to think this might be the last time, even if he's confident in the team. It's no different than what I'm sure is going through the heads of DJ Burns and the seniors on the team, which is like this might be the last time I play college basketball. Right, this might be the last time. If we lose, it's the last time I play college basketball. You think about it, whether you know, you hope you win, you hope you're playing again, but it, you know, you're aware this might. DJ Burns, DJ Burns wore the the uh, green shoes, right? Yeah. Those might have been the last shoes he ever wore in an NC State Wolfpack uniform. He had to think about that. So it's uh, it's pretty, you know, the the Gary Hahn run. Hopefully, you know. The only time he'll know for sure it's his last game is if they make the championship, which would give him a little bit of like uh, preparation closure, where you know you can let the tears. He gets get the highlight your, one last yeah, time. Yeah, the, the tears in your eyes as you're 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 lacing up your shoes. Um, next story: the women's team matching them. <laughs> the women's team is also in the final four. That and and uh, Isaiah James and Saniya Rivers and like that team is full of monsters, and it's it's. Probably, you know, obviously it's cool. I'm not saying you'd you'd want it any other way. But if the men's team wasn't on this run as an 11 seed, the run the women's team is on in a, uh, as a three seed would almost be, uh, you know, more celebrated. It is it is absurd that they have both with with their histories both in the final four at the same th- same time and almost have an an identical score. For both of their mm-hmm. games. Of course, NC State defeating Duke yesterday 76-64, to where you have a career-high night from D.J. Burns, who scored, what was it, a, a 28? And then you have Isaiah James, who had a career-high night of 27. Seven as the, threes. As the women's Wolfpack defeated Texas 76-66. to Like, that, it's kind of scary, in a sense. It's, it's, I mean, it is absurd. Uh, and, and also, I'll, I'll say this, both teams have had very much a, like, whatever you throw at us, we're going to win anyway attitude. NC State played games with with different three-point lines uh, on the women's side, won anyway. Uh, you know, a- NC State on the men's side has has had foul trouble, not foul trouble, has played Blue Bloods, Upstart, Cinderella's. It's like whatever you throw at us, we're just going to win. The, the women's team matching them is absurd. And also having UConn in both of their mm-hmm. final fours. It could be. It could, if, if things break the right way, it could be the, the uh, championship. It could be the, the final. Um, Morsell's leadership. Another story. The the story number four. Casey Morsell uh, has not always been the most gaudy stat guy for NC State, but I go back to what we talked about him talked with him about at ACC tip off before the season, where he said, right, he he wasn't recruited there, played two years at UVA, but this is his third year at State, started a ton of games. He took it upon himself to make sure everybody was welcome. He took it upon himself to make the transfers feel comfortable with the transfers from last year, with the recruited players. And I have to imagine that at times this year he had to feel like, I guess we're just not going to come together. I guess we're just not going to click. Even if we all like each other, we're just as a basketball team not going to click. But he he never stopped trying. We, you know, I, I said this, we had him on the show before the game. We had him on my afternoon show, The Drive. And, um, I said the thing that was most impressive about him was how unbelievably the same he was at every point in time we interviewed him. Interviewed him before the season, high expectations. He was one way. Interviewed him during the the rough parts of the season where things weren't looking good. He was the exact same person. Interviewed him in the middle of one of the, the greatest ACC tournament runs of all time. Exact same person. That type of leadership, that type of calming presence – 
while everyone is going to pay attention to DJ Burns and everybody's going to be wildly impressed with the double doubles from Diara or the shot by O'Connell or all, uh, you know, DJ Horn obviously being a, a cold DJ blooded, Horn swaggerific guy. Uh, Morcel was just always there. There were points against Duke where he got switched onto Kyle Filipowski and he was bullying. Kyle yeah. Filipowski in the post, and and I'm and I'm going like that's more sell. Like what? Yeah, you need me to do this? I'll do my darndest, and I'm going to set the tone for everybody else. I think his leadership is an underrated story of what NC State has going on. You could ask Casey Morcel to join the trainers out in the court, mopping up the you know with the towels yep. on their knees, like wiping up. Uh, I know, just sweat, I, and he'd do it just because that's the kind of guy he is. I like just, he is a team first, me second kind of guy. I just read this story about John Candy. Uh, do you know who John Candy is? Uncle Buck? Yeah. Okay, cool okay, Runnings? Okay. Okay, Come yeah, on, yeah. okay. Legendary comedic yes. actor. Uh, I believe it was Planes, Trains, and Auto. No, 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 no. Sorry. It was SCTV, a TV show he was on uh, in Canada. Um, and a, a crew member didn't know, like, was it like a day hire, right? Somebody that shows up to move, like, manual labor. Didn't know who John Candy was and uh, didn't know he was a star of the show. And he, the, the crew member was moving heavy boxes, and Candy was a large guy. And he couldn't move a couple of the boxes. So he said, like, hey, sir, do you, excuse me, do you mind if you help me move this box? And Candy was like, sure. Came over, was was moving boxes. And then somebody on a headset came over and was like, oh, Mr. Candy, we need you in uh, makeup in time for, for shooting. And Candy said, yeah, yeah, one second, I'm helping the crew move these boxes. And it was a cool thing. And, and that, to me, is very Casey Morcell, right? Like, um, if if – if I have to set up the chairs, if I had like, you know, the big, the big, uh, dust broom, if I got to do that so we can practice. Yeah. yeah, One second. Let, let me get this done. And then I'll go back to being a starting guard on a final four team. Then I'll go back to being one of the leaders of one of the best teams in the country. It's, it's his leadership. I think is one of the stories that that's going to be overlooked, but I'm going to do my best not to let it next story. Ben Middlebrooks, Mr. Hustle. <laughs> Ben Middlebrooks, there's two ways every play ends up, and it, it's every single play for Ben Middlebrooks. Either he gets a crucial rebound or a crucial putback, or he's on the floor. That's it. Either he is on his back having gotten tangled with somebody, either he's on his back having drawn a foul, either he's he's on his side skidding at like into the front row because he was diving for a loose ball, or he gets a rebound or he uh, has a crucial defensive play. The, the guy is, is you know, 10% heart, 90% hustle. He's he's coming off the bench knowing his role. Um, you know, when, when DJ Burns gets into foul trouble trouble or when Mo Diara gets a little uh, winded with, with playing, you know, obviously he was playing during Ramadan, so he wasn't able to eat and, and, and drink and all these things. Um, Middlebrooks is right there going like, I'll, I'll do my best. I'll, I, I may not be the most finesse, soft touch guy, but, I could be a bull in a china shop for 25 minutes a night if you need me. And it all started with his performance at the beginning of this NCAA tournament mm-hmm. against Texas Tech. I mean, again. A 21-point night. Not not to discredit him by any means, but it was one of those days where it's like, who would have thought that when, NC State's best play on the court in the first round of the NCAA tournament was going to be Ben Middlebrooks? When he pump faked, went baseline and up and under, I went like, did did, <laughs> did you know he could do that? Why? Why had? Why doesn't he do that more? And then the next game, he played like eleven minutes and had two points. Yeah. And it's just like again, it's kind of more cell like, but but with maybe without the leadership and more of like the energy guy. It's it's whatever you need at whatever time you need it to be. But I think that's also a credit to NC State in this tournament run, as far as let's not rely on just one guy to do mm-hmm. it every single night. It's nice when DJ Burns has almost thirty points. It's nice when <laughs> DJ Horn does DJ Horn things. But in contrary to what we saw a lot in the regular season, where it was just one guy filling up the stat sheet. It's been different guys in different games during this tournament run, Ben Middlebrooks included. Leads me to my next story. Mo Diara, both the glow up from at the beginning of the year, he was very much like rebound and outlet, rebound, outlet, rim defense, rebound, outlet, rim defense. He was kind of in the mix with Middlebrooks as a guy off the bench to now he's a legitimate scorer. He's 15 plus seemingly every game. He's 18 and 12. He's 14 and 13. The, 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 his glow up offensively mixed in with the fact that he is, it's during Ramadan for him. So he can't eat until sunset. Uh, and some of these games are actually earlier than, than the later games they were playing earlier in the tournament. His impact on the game is, is unbelievable. And, and then you mix in the fact that, uh, a few different times they've had 
the opposing team has had a big guy that needs to be defended, and you recognize Diara has to defend them, which allows DJ Burns to be hidden a bit on defense, so you get the benefit of his unstoppability on offense without being a liability on defense. Mo Diara has to cover for so much of him. He has to be the rebounder. He has to be the defender. He has to be that that for them. And then on top of that, he's pouring in like 16 points a game. It's it's unreal, his, his glow up, his transformation, his improvement, whatever you want to call it, from – the first two months of the season, he's shooting threes now. The first two months of the season to, to where he is now. That's just what I was going to say. He's a big guy at times. It feels like he can be a guard, and he does it really well. It was funny. I was watching the game out in downtown at a watch party at the Avenue, and it was funny when you would see Mo Diora backing a guy down low, and then mm-hmm. he would just start to step out to a three-point line. Everybody would just be like, pass to Diora. He's wide open. <laughs> like He's at a point now where you can put the ball in his hands outside the perimeter and take a three-point shot. And the fans are going to be confident that's going to go in. Which, again, is a reason why, like, DJ Burns is going to get all the lights. DJ Burns only works down low if you have a big that can space the floor. You need somebody that can shoot because that way DR doesn't have to also be in the paint clogging things up for DJ Burns with the spin moves and all the setups. Like, you need players spaced out so they can't double DJ without knowing he's going to find the shooter. It, it was – it's it's a big, big part of their success is Mo Diara, whether – Everybody's noticing it or not. Uh, Next is Michael O'Connell hitting the shot. Yep. Michael O'Connell hit the single most important shot for NC State this year. He is, at best, their fourth best scorer on the team. Uh, At worst, probably somewhere in the the seven range. And he hit the shot against – I want to make sure I have this right because I I saw it towards the end of the game, so let me bring up the stats. Against Duke, he totaled – ready for this – six points. On 39 minutes, he shot two of seven, but he did have 11 rebounds. Wait, am I getting this right? Yeah, this is the Elite Eight. He did have seven rebounds. Uh, sorry, 11 rebounds. I'm looking. I'm getting confused here. He had six points, 11 rebounds, six assists, two steals. That's him understanding his role, right? Which is, until you need me as a shooter, I'm going to be the guy that does a little bit of everything. And then when you need me, a bank rattle in uh, the shot of, of the year. And he's a transfer from Stanford, uh, probably in the, I mean, even in the triangle, in the shadow of his former teammate Harrison Ingram a little bit at, at UNC throughout the year. And and O'Connell simply, you know, waited his moment and seized it. Yeah. And it's also interesting with his lacrosse background, <laughs> playing uh, AAU basketball growing up and, I remember when Kevin Keats was on Adam Gold Show. If you missed that conversation, check it out on the best on the Adam Gold Show podcast and on the fans' YouTube channel, which I hope you're watching this episode right now on. He talked about how when he came to visit NC State, what really sold him was how confident Kevin Keats mm. told him that they could win a national championship. <laughs> And I'm I know. I'm sure at points in time this year he was like, "Coach was blowing smoke." I, yeah, and I know, <laughs> I know, so many times like that gets said over and over again as like a recruiting tactic. But shouts to O'Connell. I mean, yeah, may, there might have been some points where behind right. closed doors he's looking at the mirror and he's like, "What am I doing?" As he sees er- Harrison Ingram putting yep. up the numbers he was doing two at UNC. Away. But now they're two wins away from that. Might that that could be a real accomplishment for Michael O'Connell in his career at NC State. Which, and, he, and he's probably coming back next year. Which brings me to my next story. Kevin Keats' job. <laughs> we could have a whole separate podcast when, on this topic. When I tell you at the ACC tournament, even after they beat Louisville, even maybe after they beat Syracuse, like other media members come up and go like, so what do you think they're going to do with Kevin Keats? So you think he's on his way out? So what What do you think? Right, And, and it's just, you know, oh, I, didn't, I haven't heard anything, but here's what, you know, my gut reaction is. There was not a lot saying massive raise, huge amounts of money coming Kevin Keats way. Uh, there were some saying, I think they might give him one more year. I don't know if they can afford the buyout of his contract, but if they can raise the money, the guy has made a boatload of money. He's, Just he's in this tournament. Over a quarter million dollars in incentives this year already, and I haven't even added what whatever the incentive was for the Final Four. Uh, two-year job extension. Uh, he'll never have to pay for a drink in, in Raleigh ever again. If he, if he walks into a bar, there's going to be somebody there wearing red going like, Coach drinks on my tap. Or Wilmington, too, at Jimmy's at, in Wrightsville Beach. Uh, it, is, it is unbelievable. You know, people say winning solves everything. Winning solves everything. Everything. Suddenly, 
and I've said this on, on air. I've, I've probably said this on the podcast. Because they've won nine straight, because at the time they won eight straight last time I said it, uh, the things that used to bother me about Kevin Keats this year don't bother me as much. How many times this year did I say these players can't uh, get into a rhythm when their roles aren't defined? When yep. you don't know if you're going to play 10 minutes or 35 minutes going into the game, how do you get into a rhythm? Now I'm saying – it's, it's awesome. The other team has no idea what's coming at them. They don't know if they're going to get 10 minutes or 35 minutes of anybody on the team. It's unpredictable. You can't game plan for them. The only difference is they, they won nine consecutive games. And I'll say, like, is that me being a flip-flopper? Maybe is that me being reactionary? 100%. But it's, it's Kevin Keats, by way of winning nine games in a row, has completely changed a ton of opinions about him, and that is included in – his contract, like the money is different. He got a $400,000 raise for next year automatically. That's not, you know, that's talking with the scoreboard. That's not going into your boss and saying, hey, you know, I, I feel like I've been doing a pretty good job. I've been putting in the work. Our, our, you know, morale and numbers are up. I think I deserve a raise. That is walking in and saying, with your chest out a little where's bit, where's my 400 grand for next year? Bring me my money. Because it's in the contract that it's mine. And oh, by the way, I'm putting a down payment on on a on a bigger house. Like I'm I'm growing roots here because you can't get rid of me. Not because you don't choose to, because I've put in the work to make sure you can't. I'm glad you brought up the X's and O's X's and O's side of things because I just want to bring up a little bit of a fan's perspective. Mm-hmm. As you guys know, if you're not following 999 the fan on Instagram, you're missing out on a lot of content that I'm doing. Boots on the ground. Two of my some of my favorite moments from being out at the bell tower mm-hmm. Friday night. When I was in the middle of everything, I was sort of in the middle. Which was the a win. That's the Sweet 16 win. That was the Sweet 16 win. All of a sudden, to the left of me, you heard students saying, clear the way, clear the way, let him through. And I'm like, who are we letting through? And I see like these three guys carrying this cutout poster, or this cutout board that you see beside a Coca-Cola display mm-hmm. at a food line of Kevin Keats. There it is. And when they get to the very top of the steps, they hold up the cutout and everybody just loses their mind. And they're just like Kev. They're like chanting his name as if he's there, like it's an idol. I saw other posts. Pole. I saw other posters that said, "Kevin, I'm sorry, Kevin. I didn't. I, w- I was unfamiliar with your game. We spoke- I, I apologize. I yeah. was unfamiliar with We've your game. We even speak it. We had to speak into existence. Kevin Keats is the winner. I had somebody last night tell me, not only do we need a Peyton Wilson statue in Raleigh, it's now time that we start building the Kevin Keats statue. They haven't even won the national they, championship hey, yet. If they win a national championship, I'm fine with a. Tr- uh, 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 a statue for whoever you want. You want a DJ Burns statue. You want a Kevin Keats statue. Whoever, whatever statue you want. Statue you want of that. an ice cream cone for put Lord's the, sake. Put, like what? Put the uh, the the team picture in statue form. Do what you yeah. got to do. Uh, next story. We have two more. We've been through eight stories and they've had side tangents, so we're probably up to like fourteen stories. Uh, DJ Horn returning home. Yeah. DJ Horn from Cary. Right. He is a triangle kid who had to go to two other schools, most recently Arizona State, and then he ends up back home at NC State uh, and and takes his hometown on this ride. Uh, he has, I believe, a 919 tattoo. He talks about 919 in postgame uh, press conferences. Like, DJ Horn is living the, like, the best part of the transfer portal. You have one year left. Maybe the NBA is calling. Maybe they're not. You want to go have the 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 opportunity to play in front of everybody you know. You want your mom, your dad, your high school friends, your your grocery store clerks. You want everybody to come watch you play. You go play your game at home, and then not only that, you take your home city on a ride like this. That is stuff that that athletes don't always get. Right. That is stuff that athletes don't always have the opportunity to do. And DJ Horn is living that dream. And and in, in a lot of ways, his city is living that dream right alongside him. They're living it through him. And the most like sentimental part of all of that is after they won the ACC championship, DJ Horn, you know, when the rest of the guys are celebrating, he took a couple minutes by himself just to kind of sit down and embrace it all. And started to get emotional. Mm-hmm. And I think that's when it really struck me, and I think the rest of Wolfpack Nation, not to say that they didn't love DJ Horn before as a player, but just as a hometown kid, that's when it really touched him. Like, we're so glad that he made his way back to Raleigh. And he's playing with swagger. Like, when he gets the ball and there's a must-have bucket, 
he knows he's going to make the shot. Yeah. And and he's undersized, which always makes it more of like aesthetically pleasing, where, you know, he's fading away with a hand in his face and he and he looks a little bit smaller. But how many times and I feel that like this is the stuff where as a fan you notice it and you know it's not what he's doing, but you kind of feel like it might be what he's doing. It felt like every big shot he hit, he dribbled right in front of the NC State bench to hit it so he could release it goes in and then he turns and like gives a head nod to his team on the on the bench. That might be the best way that NC State like I can tell this NC State team. A lot of players score, what do they do? Flex for the crowd, right? Yeah. They're 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 very present and looking out towards the stands. Trying a, to find a camera. A lot of teams they they hit a shot, what are they doing? They're looking for the other team's bench to to preen and to to peacock around a little bit and maybe talk some trash. State did a lot that was very obvious for them. Like it was, I scored, I'm looking at my bench. I'm looking at my guys. Because 20 days ago, we were the only ones that cared about what we were doing. When we celebrated, Jim Beheim told us that it, that we shouldn't be celebrating because we hadn't done anything. That was 19 days ago. He did it on air in the in the Louisville game, 19 days ago from yesterday uh, when the, the Elite Eight was played. When when what state has done is very much for them. It's it's not for anyone else, and I think that's part of why they're so likable, right? The the most likable people are not the ones trying to be likable. They're the ones trying to be themselves. Like uh, when when you listen to a um like a great uh, writer of of a comedy show or a creator of a comedy show, they they almost all universally say, "I was just trying to write what my friends would laugh at." Right. I was trying I was trying to come up with jokes that my buddy would laugh at and then turns out America thought they were funny too. Uh like like it feels like state is very much doing what they think their teammates are going to appreciate. And then oh by the way they became America's team in the process, right? DJ Burns is like trying to do what what, you know, DJ Horn is going to give him a chest bump about. And then, oh, look at that. America fell in love with DJ Burns. It's just, it's for them, and I really appreciate that. You mentioned the Michael O'Connell shot being so significant in this NCAA tournament run, and also, well, in the ACC tournament, potentially mm-hmm. jump-starting, no pun intended, this uh-huh. NCAA tournament run, I'd like to nominate an honorable mention. Okay. Hey, there's, there's, this is a wide category. DJ Horn put back three with the hand in his face against Marquette after mm-hmm. Marquette was starting to make that run to come back into that game and then blowing the kiss to the Marquette fans. That's the only time that I've seen him not do a sign towards his bench. Oh, but well, that's another significant moment that I'll remember in this NCAA tournament run. Don't, don't get State. me wrong. There are moments that are for other people. DJ Horn, if you recall, against Wake in the regular season, flipped the double bird at the ref. <laughs> uh, like, like they, they are aware of the situation they are in. They are aware of the – uh the the eyeballs on them it just you know even that it's probably like that was to make you know i wanted my teammates you know, like everything just seems like it's coming from there the the blowing of the kiss heck you could say that was to that was to you know let them know what his teammates were doing uh final story and and again i didn't put these in any order but you knew where i had to end uh dj burns yep the guy is unreal he's everywhere now i mean you look on twitter like dj burns has been trending i feel like for the past 2 weeks DJ Burns with the ball in his hands. Do you know what is the craziest part about DJ Burns? DJ Burns is the player of the tournament, right? He's he's maybe, you know, ED is more productive, but DJ Burns is the storybook player of the tournament, right? Everybody loves watching him. He, they they he he's building up a fan base. He's getting the NIL deals. He's on every single podcast and and, and everything uh nationally. And and do you realize how impressive it is? He doesn't dunk and he doesn't shoot threes. How impossible is it in modern basketball when I can go on Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok and just type in like basketball highlights and I can see people in games, uh, you know, doing Steph Curry stuff where they're pulling up from the logo or LeBron stuff where they're dunking on everybody. And that's happening every single day. And DJ Burns has captivated the country with spin moves and finger rolls, with hook shots and layups off the glass, with with backing down slowly, followed by fadeaway jumpers. He he has somehow made the part of basketball that is traditionally seen as uncool as very cool. It's crazy when you look up DJ Burns on Twitter and the first thing you see is a clip from First take about 13 minutes ago that says, add Shannon Sharp and Stephen A. Smith to the bingo of media members who believe that North Carolina NC State big man DJ Burns can play in the NFL. 
Like, that's just how much of I, a nationwide story he's become. I get that. It, and by the way, like I get that the size makes you think that. I've said it. I believe it. But he's a pretty darn good basketball player, too. Yeah. He's a pretty darn good basketball player, too. Uh, I think he's one of those guys. He probably, uh, you know, put a golf club in his hand. Pretty good. He's got the hand-eye coordination. Put a tennis racket in his hand. Pretty good. America's big man. If he, if he wants to be uh, Pablo Sandoval in the hot corner, uh, it might be a little bit difficult being 6'9", but hey, possibly. And the best part about it is the run isn't over. Those are 10 stories. Could have done 200. There's there's going to be more, right? They're playing on, on Saturday in, in the Final Four. So we encourage you to stay tuned right here to uh, Pack Therapy. We encourage you to keep listening. We encourage you to pass this around to your friends. We encourage you to enjoy the run. There's a lot of encouragement going on. Uh, Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time.